All right, welcome everyone to our Quercus Quest training webinar. Um, on behalf of the USA National Phenology Network, I just wanted to welcome you all. This is one of our Nature's Notebook data collection campaigns. Um, and these are campaigns where we invite our Nature's Notebook observers to collect data on species that are of special interest to researchers or natural resource managers. I'm Erin Postumus. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network. And I'm joined today by Samantha Brewer, who is our Volunteer Engagement Coordinator. We're also fortunate to have a few of the researchers who are behind this campaign joining us today. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hipp is a research ecologist with, or oh, sorry, is a senior scientist in plant systematics. Um, and he's also the herbarium director at the Morton Arboretum, which is in Illinois. We're also joined by Dr. Ian Pierce, who's a research ecologist with the US Geological Survey, which is based in um, Fort Collins at the Science Center there in Colorado. And Dr. Janine cavender Barres, who is a distinguished McKnight University professor in the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota. Um, and Mira Gardner is also joining us today. She is the research coordinator at the Warden Arboretum. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, before we get started, just a quick orientation to our Zoom webinar. So you'll notice that you have a panel at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on how it's oriented. Um, and you'll see that there's a little Q&A button there. Um, we invite you to put any questions you have during the webinar in that Q&A box. We will have a time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you'd like to put anything in the chat, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, you can say hello, put your where you're calling in from, anything else you'd like to share. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, feel free to put that there as well. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sending out the recording via email um, after the webinar is done. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Andrew Hipp, who's going to kick us off, um, sharing some background about the research that's behind this, this study that um, actually inspired this campaign. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to you, Andrew. That sounds great. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, I would show you what I look like, but my video isn't work, isn't allowed. So I, I'm a short guy with glasses and somewhat balding. Uh, I'm uh, one of a group of collaborators who are working with, um, working on understanding the Eastern North American white oak group that you're working on as part of this Quercus Quest. And Erin, should I go ahead and share share the uh, presentation from my screen? Okay, that sounds good. That would be great. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Participants can see my screen. Um, are you all seeing my presentation at this point? Okay, great. Thanks so much, Aaron. So anyway, welcome. This is our this is our group. Uh, we are a group of an international group of researchers working in China and East and North America, investigating how um, diversity of oaks in East Asia and in Eastern North America shape the forests that we live in today. This is a National Science Foundation uh, funded project funded jointly by the um, Science Foundations of North of the US and of China, uh, jointly working with our two groups. Uh, this is the US group is here on the outside of the circle and the Chinese uh, team is represented here in the upper central. So the broad question we're asking is when we look at oak evolutionary history, the tree of life, genetic diversity within oaks, so looking at the genes that make oaks what they are, oh, sorry, uh, and oak functional traits, the attributes of the leaves, the roots, growth rates, all the things that we can observe on a tree that makes it operate the way it does. How do all those kinds of diversity influence one another, as well as the communities of organisms that live on oaks? So we're looking at things like leaf endophytic fungi. Um, these are fungi that live inside the leaves, mycorrhizal and endophytic fungi within the roots. Gall wasps, and Ian Pierce, who's, who's here today, uh, is the gall wasp expert, and I may be talking with you about his gall wasp work today, and leaf herbivores, uh, which Ian is also the expert on. Those are insects that gobble up leaves. 
Um, so these Eastern North American oak group, as well as the East Asian white oak groups, we're working on these uh, in parallel, are what we call a syngamion. Uh, Sin for together, gamion for gene flow. These are good species across their range. Uh, when you look around the range, you can recognize things like white oak, things like bur oak, things like post oak, things like swamp white oak, despite the fact that there's a long history of gene flow between them. When you look at this diagram, each of these dashed lines represents an uh, act of love or at least passion between two oak trees. Uh, this movement of genes between oaks has the potential to pass traits that allow them to survive well in their environments between species. That's called adaptive gene flow. And that's likely a key to the ecological and evolutionary success of oaks, but we don't know for sure. So we're trying to understand the range of these species, gene flow between these species and their traits as a way of getting at how they shape the forest organisms. When you go out and you make observations of flowering time, leaf out phenology, um, of bur oak right here, this is, this is our, our main species, as well as all the white oaks it co-occurs with, it gives us understanding of species potential to cross pollinate. So their potential to hybridize and the timing of resources that they make available to fungi, insects, and um, to other forest trees when they drop their leaves. So if you were here last year, you saw this presentation. In case you were here last year, I just wanna give you a little update of what's happened in the last year. Mira Garner, who's on the call, uh, led a really impressive range-wide sampling um, uh, campaign in 2023. All these red dots are locations that Mira uh, and her um, research assistant in the field, Leah Samuels, who's not with us today, uh, visited in the field. It was over 50 sites. So let's give it up for Mira. Uh, they collected oaks at every one of these sites for a total of about 540, 550 white oak species. And this gives you the numbers that they are collecting up here. Your observations uh, complement their work because the data that we're collecting includes genomes, these trait data, tree traits, community traits, and the symbionts, the, the, community, uh, the organisms that are living on the uh, species. But Mira was only able to get to most sites once, and then Ian and his group made a, made a follow-up visit once. That's not enough visits to get really good phenological data. The phenology data were depending on you to get that range-wide phenology data. Um, these observations that you make will really help contextualize our understanding of introgression and adaptation to climate across this group. In addition, the data that you collect will complement the range-wide sample uh, in a common garden that we're planting at three sites, uh, Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve, uh, that's led by Janine kevner Barris, who's the mastermind behind these common gardens, the Morton Arboretum, uh, which is our site uh, where Mira and I are working, and Kessler Atmospheric and Ecological Field Station in Oklahoma, where our collaborating PI, Heather McCarthy, who's not here today, uh, is planting her garden. We'll be able to observe phenology in these gardens. Your range-wide phenology data will let us know what we should expect in these gardens. Okay, now I'm gonna pass it along to Ian Pierce. Ian, it's off to you. And if you Hi. want, I can just run the slide. If you want, Ian, I can run the slideshow from here if you just tell, tell me when to advance slides. Excellent. I'll, I'll just do that, Andrew. I'll, I'll say advance when we need to move forward. So, uh, so my part of this project is predominantly looking at the organisms that uh, interact with oak trees and uh, of those really focusing on herbivorous insects. And um, of those, because oaks have a tremendous diversity of uh, herbivores, caterpillars, true bugs, other things up in their canopy. We're looking uh, specifically at gall wasps on the trees. These gall wasps are really host specific, so they'll eat uh, only one or a couple of different oak species. Uh, and they, they are pretty amazing in that they trick the 
leaves or trick the, the tree into producing these structures in which the larvae develop and uh, turn into adult insects. Um, some of these structures are really spectacular, and you can see these, uh, these pictures uh, here on the slide of that. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're fun things to go uh, look at uh, on the trees. So throughout the range of these oaks, we see tremendous variation uh, in the abundance of different gall wasp species on oak trees. And um, one of the many things that might cause that uh, would be the phenology of the leaves. Um, we don't really have enough data yet to be able to determine that, but I, I want to give a, sort of an analogy to a previous project just to show how important this can be uh, for uh, the interactions oaks have with insects or other organisms. Um, if you don't mind advancing the slide, Andrew. So, so this is this is uh, data from uh, a different project that I did uh, several years ago uh, on oak trees in California. And in this project, uh, we planted those oaks in a common garden uh, down near Santa Barbara, near where it says Sedgwick uh, on the map. And we looked at uh, the amounts of different herbivorous on er herbivorous insects on those trees, uh, thinking here mostly about uh, leaf mining caterpillars. And uh, so what you can see is that some populations have uh, a lot of herbivorous insects and others have very few. Those populations also differ tremendously in their phenology. Um, and if you don't mind advancing to the next slide, where, uh, where the sites from uh, Northern California set leaf a lot earlier. And this, this diagram here with all of the arrows in it and different numbers is just to suggest that, uh, that the thing that causes the difference between these different populations in terms of the number of these uh, mining insects on the leaves is really leaf phenology. So those sites that leafed out really late in the year basically avoided the major herbivores in the system and had a lower abundance of, uh, of leaf mines on them. Similarly, uh, this accounts for the, the genetic effects where uh, maternal sib families from within a population had significant difference in leaf phenology. And this seemed to cause the difference in uh, leaf mines on these leaves. And, and this makes a lot of sense because these are herbivores that colonize leaves very early in the season, as many do when the leaves are kind of young and fresh and uh, the, the caterpillar can do very well on them. Um, so, so yeah, this is just an analogy to, to say that, that, yeah, leaf phenology seems like it is one of these key traits to how plants, and specifically oak trees, uh, interact with a broad suite of organisms uh, like herbivorous insects. And I'll, uh, I'll keep that short and pass this on to, um, I believe Janine is next. Hi, can you hear me? And I don't know if you want to put the video on. Sure, okay. you can share your video if you like. Okay, it says it says that the host has stopped it. But, um, oh, can you go back one slide? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Janine, do you want me to show it here? Did you want to project it from your screen? Oh, no, you go ahead and show it. It's only two slides. That sounds good. Okay, and back one more slide. Yep, just, yep, absolutely. Okay. Great. There. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna do is show you an example of how phenology influences gene flow. And that is important in understanding assortative mating and uh, niche partitioning, especially among sympatric species. So Andrew talked to you about these white oaks that that uh, overlap in range with um, the bur oaks overlap in range with a number of white oak species. So they're sharing genes with their with their neighboring white oak species. How do they then maintain species integrity and maintain? the ability to coexist if they're sharing genes. So that's a longstanding question. And one way they can do that potentially is through um, isolation by 
time or having slightly different flowering times so that they um, they are different species are not sharing as many genes as they might be. Um, and if you're in the southeastern U.S., these uh, these two oak species, Quercus geminata and Quercus virginiana, in the live oak group, they are sister to the white oak group in the section Varenti. So these are not the California oaks; these are the eastern the eastern live oaks in section Varenti. Varentis they they coexist. They're they're um, sympatric but they occupy slightly different hydrologic niches. And you can see Quercus geminata, the sand live oak, occurs in drier environments than Quercus virginiana, which can has a broad range of habitats, but can occur in pretty wet places as well. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, these are beautiful trees that are uh, protected in, in many Southern states. But how do they maintain these distinct hydrologic niches? And um, OK, next slide. So we have some intriguing results from the past, but not a complete story. And so here you can see the, the distributions of these species in the southeastern United States. They have overlapping ranges, although Quercus virginiana has a little bit broader distribution than Quercus geminata. Um, and we can look at their leaf morphology in addition to their hydrologic niche where they occur, their leaf morphology. We, we did an index of, of morphological variation and they have different um, leaf traits. So a bimodal distribution of their leaf traits. And then we measured the flowering time of the male flowers. So not the female flowers because the female flower is pretty hard to see, but we, we did a brief study just in, um, just in the Gainesville area of Florida. And, and it looks like Quercus virginiana is uh, flowering a few weeks before um, Quercus geminata. And that kind of makes sense because it occurs in wetter places. Flowers need a lot of moisture to, uh, to be produced and to be sustained. And so if they're occurring in wetter places, they're more likely to be able to produce flowers before the, um, even before the rains start again. So it's possible that the hydraulic niche is contributing to flowering time separation. Um, it's not clear, but having slightly different flowering times can contribute to assortative mating so that even though they do hybridize with each other, and you can see that on the bottom graph where the y-axis is the proportion of ancestry and the black is um, Quercus geminata and the gray is Quercus virginiana. And you can see that some of the individuals share alleles from both um, both of those species. So there are definitely hybrids in there, but for the most part, there's pretty coherence. There's a lot of coherence and, and individuals are mostly one species or the other. So they're not intergressing and they're not hybridizing as much as they could be. And this could be due to flowering time separation, but it may be that flowering time separation, um, this, this phenological variation of flowering time varies with latitude because as you go farther north, there's just a, a shorter growing season. So there's less, there's less of a season in which to have separation and flowering time. So we could hypothesize that there would be higher introgression farther north when the, when the season is shorter and the opportunity for separating flower time, flowering time is lower. But these are unanswered questions. Um, and so we're really interested in understanding um, the difference in flowering time among species because it informs our understanding of introgression, assortative mating, and niche ecological niche differentiation. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you for sharing some of the, the many different aspects of this research project. It's a really interesting project and it's nice to get a, a little taste of how phenology fits into so many different aspects. So thank you all. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Samantha Brewer, and she's going to be taking us through how you can participate in the campaign. Well, welcome. Thank you all again for joining with us today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you guys can get involved and contribute um, data to this project. Um, so 
We've talked a little bit about the research. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the USA National Phenology Network and our citizen science or community science program called Nature's Notebook and how you can enter phenology data on your oak trees and, um, and contribute that data so that researchers can use it to answer these questions. Um, we'll talk about also how to get started with the Quirkus Quest campaign. Um, and talk a little bit about some of the resources and other materials we have available to you guys. And then we'll end with a Q&A where you guys will have an opportunity to ask us questions or get any clarifications. Um, also in the chat, if you'd like to, we did get the chat opened up. Um, so you can let us know where you're joining us from if you'd like, and if you'd like to, any of the oak species that you have around you. So a little bit about last year's data. Um, so last year we had 133 different backyard observers and backyard observers are just kind of individuals who are contributing data from their own oak trees. And then also we had 48 local phenology programs contribute data to this project. And local phenology programs are generally like an organization or a school where you'll have groups of volunteers who are contributing data to on the same plants. And then our top contributing local phenology programs from last year were Meredith College, Earthwise Aware, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Crosby Farm Park, and um, Mount Auburn Cemetery Citizen Scientists. So a little round of applause for you guys, but really everyone who's joined us contributing data, thank you all so much for participating last year. And for those of you who are new to the project, welcome. Um, we hope that you really enjoy um, observing your oak trees, learning about their phenology and um, participating in this project. A little bit about last year's data. So this is showing some um, data on white oaks that were collected from Earthwise Aware last year. And so this is a phenology calendar. And this is kind of one of the neat things about Nature's Notebook is you get this kind of continuous data set um, where we can see what what was going on with the oaks and even what's also important is what wasn't going on throughout the year. So all the colored lines in this calendar are showing when these um, phenophases or when these um, parts of the oak were present. Um, so as you can see right here with initial shoot and leaf growth for the white oaks was occurring around May. Um, the leaves and needles, so leaves or leaves, excuse me, leaves were present in these oaks from May until um, we were still getting reports in mid-November. And then the flowers or pollen cones, we had reports of flowers for yes in May and uh, one yes that was appearing over here in June. And what's important too is we also have these gray bars, which is when people reported no. So these are all the times that people saw no initial um, leaf growth or no leaves or no flowers. And that's really cool because then when you're saying, okay, we're out here looking at this tree, we see no leaves or no initial growth, no leaf growth, no leaf growth, and now we're seeing leaf growth. So we know when, um, when these periods in their life cycle were actually beginning. And then we go back here and we say there was no more leaf growth. So we know this is when it was ending. So that's why it's really um, important to be able to go and check your oaks um, at least once a week, if you're able to, when these phenophases might occur, um, so that we know when they started and when they ended. And a little bit more about last year's data too. These are sites um, across uh, the Eastern United States um, with white oak in triangles, bur oak with um, squares and chestnut oak with hexagons. Um, you can see where sites um, reported the first yes report with a prior no report within seven days. And this is really important because um, what we're showing with these flowers is someone was out there looking at these oaks and they said, no flowers, no flowers, no flowers. Now we see flowers. And so with a nice seven day window that gives us a really accurate, um, accurate reading of when flowering was actually beginning on these plants. And then um, down here, the colors of the shapes is when these first yeses started to appear. So um, you can see down here, it looks like it may have been uh, around March uh, that we're starting to see some of these flowers. And then this is another um, graph or visualization showing with um, kind of the top five observed oak species last year when leaves were present. 
I think it's really neat because you see with the live oak, live oak have leaves being observed all year round. Um, but for these bur oak, swamp oak, chestnut oak, and live oak are, um, sorry, and um, white oak, you can see that the leaves started kind of appearing in the middle of April. Um, and then they, you see like, oh, we're getting more and more reports of these leaves. The oaks are leafed out here throughout the summer. And then you can see the leaves starting to fall down here in November. And then the timing of flowers for these different species. Um, you can see the live oak flowers. We're kind of here in March, um, a little earlier than the other species. And then the other species here, you can see flowers beginning to be reported in white oak a little bit earlier in the year. Um, and then for the other oak species, again in um, April. Um, and then you can see that flowering kind of peaked here in the middle of May and then dropped back down as, um, as the flowers drop and we see less reports of flowers in June. So the purpose of the National Phenology Network, um, and so the National Phenology Network, um, our kind of responsibility is to collect, store, and share phenology data and information. Um, and so phenology, once again, is kind of a term that not a lot of people know. Some of you may not be very familiar with it by now, but um, most people understand the concept of phenology and it's how plants and animals change throughout the years in spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, you'll see them go through shifts where they'll be flowering or forming leaves or dropping their leaves in the fall. And you'll see that in animals too, right? With butterflies will come and lay their eggs and they'll go through their caterpillar stage, uh, pupae stage, and then um, out as a butterfly. And so Nature's Notebook is the citizen science program that's run by the USA National Phenology Network. Um, and people all across the United States um, are collecting data on various plants and animals that researchers then can use to understand um, any shifts in timing of phenology or just any general patterns. If there are some plants or animals we don't know much about when they're um, expressing different phenophases. And so we have volunteers all across the United States who are um, collecting data um, that is freely available for researchers to be able to use. And um, the way that people track this may be different, right? So before some of you who may have never used Nature's Notebook, um, you can put in the chat if you like, but what are ways that you pay attention to plant and animal life cycles? Because once again, when we think about like phenology and the study of these seasonal changes, um, we might often think of like collecting the data and like, yes, you see flowers or no, you don't see flowers. Um, but there's lots of different ways that people pay attention to the seasons around them. So if you want, you can put in the chat just some of the ways that you pay attention to the seasons. Are there any seasonal events that you look forward to? Like if there's a certain time of year that you're like, you know, your certain, uh, your favorite fruit is going to be starting to come out or just seeing those first buds that appear in the springtime. Or even autumn, love autumn, because you get the smell, good leafy smell. And so um, with the USA National Phenology Network and Nature's Notebook, we have um, several different data collection campaigns. So Quirkus Quest is one of them. Um, but there's many different researchers who have all sorts of questions about what's going on in phenology all across the United States. Um, we have researchers who are looking at um, what is going on with redbud phenology. Flowers for bats is one that happens and uh, is one that's focused primarily in Arizona, where we're looking at when is next available for migrating bat species, um, and even pest patrol and looking at patterns in um, certain pest species that might be, that will, um, to help land managers better understand when they can do certain management efforts. And what's really cool too is you can explore the data that's collected with our visualization tool. Um, so Erin, if you're able to put the link in the chat, that would be great. Um, but you guys can also visit data.usanpn.org slash viz tool. And there's a great visualization tool where you can look at the data that people are collecting and compare it to what you're seeing in your area. Um, right now, spring has been moving across the country. And so you can kind of see when spring conditions are being met where you're living or if you've already been experiencing spring conditions. Um, but you can explore all that with our visualization tool as well. And there's also ways to explore the way how your data are being used. So more and more often, 
data collected by volunteer researchers and citizen science is um, the value of that is really been shown to be really, really important. Um, and more and more researchers are using data collected by citizen scientists to um, analyze what's going on um, in the natural world around us. Um, there have been over, I believe over a hundred papers published using data that was um, collected through Nature's Notebook um, and the USA and, and really the volunteers um, through Nature's Notebook who collect that data. So again, thank you all so much for participating in these efforts. Um, it is usable and we are able to learn a lot of information from what you're observing on the ground. Um, so this campaign though is focusing mainly on Quercus Quest, right? So we're looking at um, various oak species, especially in the Eastern United States, um, but also the Western United States. If you've got some oaks and you're visiting us from there, um, we'd love for you to be able to participate. And how to get started and so how you can collect data um, to contribute to this campaign um, is first you're gonna, I'm gonna take you through these steps. It's not just gonna be this, but I'm gonna go over these again in more detail, um, but you'll create an account with Nature's Notebook and then you'll add a personal site and your personal site is just gonna be kind of your research area. So if you know of a favorite oak tree that you'd like to monitor for this project, um, you would create a personal site where that oak tree is. And then you're gonna add your oak tree or whatever Quercus Quest species you're gonna be looking for to your site. Then you're gonna record the data on your oaks. So you'll visit your oak regularly and record what you're seeing on your oaks. And you can also sign up for campaign emails. And so the campaign emails are where we will be regularly, um, every few weeks or so, we send out updates to what you've been reporting on your oak species. If you're seeing flowering or if you're seeing fruiting, um, and we can show you some of those visualizations like I showed at the beginning of what you're reporting. So to create a Nature's Notebook account, um, one of the easier ways to do it is in the Nature's Notebook app. Um, so if you have either a I, an I, iOS or Android phone, um, you can look for this icon if you look for Nature's Notebook. Um, and download the app, and then you can create an account. So you'll create a username, confirm your email address, make a password so that you can start contributing data. Once you create your account, you'll be prompted to add a personal site. So once again, your personal site is gonna be your area where the, your oak trees are. Um, so a map will show up, and so you can zoom in on the map where your site is, or you can enter your address if you know the address of the location of your oak, um, and it will create a site for you. And this is really important to know where this is because it will also tie the data you collect on your oak tree to the climate data, longitudinal data, um, so that we can start making these connections between the environment and what's going on with the oak trees. So to create a site, it will come right down here where you can create a site and make sure also if you have like, I mean, some of you might have a lot of gumption, right? And you're like, I wanna travel like, you know, an hour away to find my oak species, um, but that's not always like really convenient and you might not be able to collect regular data. So make sure that um, when you're creating a site, it's a convenient site, it's representative of kind of the area that you're in. Um, the habitat is relatively uniform and it's an appropriate size, right? If you have a several acre site, you might have a hard time being able to collect data on all the oak trees that you want to collect data on. If you're new to this project, it's usually good to start small, start with a few oak trees while you get the hang of it because you can always add more individuals to your site later. So once you've created a site, you can add your oaks. So down here, it says you can add your plants and animals. Um, and at the top, it'll let you type in the name of the oak species that you want to add. Um, for the Quercus Quest project, these are the oak species that um, we're looking for data on. So white oak, swamp white oak, sand live oak, overcup oak, it's fun to say oak, fir oak, swamp chestnut oak, chestnut oak, chinkapin oak, dwarf chinkapin oak, post oak, and southern live oak. So these are the specific species. If you had another oak species that's not on this particular list that's available in Nature's Notebook, um, you could collect data on that oak as well. If you're like, I don't have any of these species, but I still want to contribute. It wouldn't necessarily go to the Quercus Quest project, but that data is still going to be there in the database available for researchers. And so, yep, right here, you can add your plants and animals. 
if you're already a nature's notebook observer, you're like, hey, hey I've already been um, observing red buds, red buds, but I really enjoy this. I'd like to add oaks. You can add an oak to your existing site, or you can make a new site for your oak. Because once again, your site is just that location where your oaks are. So if you have um, a site that's on the east side of town that has your red buds, but you want to look at some oaks on the west side of town, you just create a new site where those oaks are, and then you can add oaks to that site. So you can alternate um, between your different kind of research sites where you're observing your oaks. And then you're gonna record data on your oak. So with Nature's Notebook, we have a list of set protocols because you're like, how do I know if I'm actually seeing flowers on my oak? Or how do I know if these leaves are growing or if they're still in the breaking leaf bud stage? So we have specific protocols and definitions for each what we call phenophase or like which stage of phenology your oaks are in. And what you're doing when you're recording data is you're just answering questions of what you see on your oak, which is, do you see breaking leaf buds on your oak? Or do you see leaves? Do you see increasing leaf size? And what you're answering is, well, yes, I do see breaking leaf buds. Yes, I see leaves, but no, I don't see color leaves. No, I don't see flowers. So when you go out regularly, you're collecting that yes or no data that I showed on that calendar that had like the gray lines and the green lines. So you're putting in there, yep, I was at this oak, but nope, there are no leaves yet. You go out next week, maybe there are gonna be leaves. And so then you're pinpointing when exactly those leaves started appearing on your oak trees. And then for each species of oak, there may be specific definitions for each phenophase. Um, with fruits, especially like some oaks will have different types of fruits or, or different ways that fruits look when they're ripe. And so you can get specific definitions on those. Um, so for more information for the different oak species in the phenophases, you can go to usanpn.org slash nn slash quest as well. Um, but yeah, for the purpose for the Quercus Quest research, we're really focusing on breaking leaf buds, leaves and increasing leaf size, as well as flowers, um, open flowers and pollen release. So we know that there's like a lot of phenology, especially if you're not super familiar with oaks, it can seem really overwhelming at first. So if you're just starting, it's okay if you just focus on learning like what are the definitions for breaking leaf buds and flowers and leaves, because those are kind of the, the phenophases that we're most focused on for this research. Um, it's okay to leave things blank. I'll add up with that. And it's okay if you're not sure. I always tell people to embrace the question mark. It's okay to be not sure, especially in your first year, because you can always go back if you're like, oh wait, yes, that was definitely a leaf. You can go back and say yes later. All right, and it should be noted also that sometimes you'll see multiple phenophases happening at the same time. So this isn't like an either or, you're not gonna say like, yes, I see leaves, but I also see flowers, right? You can see leaves and you can see flowers and you can see um, probably not fruits at the same time as flowers, but, um, but you can see multiple phenophases at the same time. So like if you're looking at this, um, these phenophases through time, right? You might start saying, yes, I see leaf breaking leaf buds. I see leaves at the same time as breaking leaf buds because some branches might have those breaking buds, some branches the leaves are a little bit out more. And you may also see increasing leaf size during this time. And then at the end of the season, right, your leaves will start changing to colored leaves and you'll see colored leaves at the same time that you're seeing leaves because if you're seeing colored leaves, then you're obviously seeing leaves at the same time. And then you may start to see falling leaves at the end of the season. Same with flower buds, you might expect to see flowers or flower buds you'll see those flowers start to open up through time, then they'll start to release their pollen. And then if some of those flowers, um, if some of the female flowers got pollinated, you might see some fruits and ripe fruits, and then you'll start seeing those fruits and seeds drop. But once again, you can, you'll see flowers, and then you might also see open flowers, and you might also see pollen relief, release, and you might also see some fruits. So you might see multiple at the same time, that's totally fine to enter everything that you're observing. And once again, we're focusing more though on the breaking leaf buds and the flowers and flower buds and leaf sizes. Um, so oaks have um, different types of flowers. You'll have male flowers, which are the ones that you'll usually see on your oak trees and they'll have these like inflorescences. Oh, I know they have a specific word. I don't remember it at the right, right now, but um, I know there's a specific term for their inflorescences, but you'll see these very distinctive um, male oak flowers, 
And then the female flowers are just teeny tiny female flowers. You may never see a female flower and that is okay. You'll often see fruits um, afterwards, but not always, um, but you may see fruits if they did get, um, if they did get fertilized. Um, but don't stress out too much if you don't notice those female flowers, they're really itty bitty. But if I was recording data on this oak, um, for this one, so here you can actually see there's some breaking leaf buds. We've also got increasing leaf size right here. Um, we're reporting um, for this, oh, sorry. Yes, for breaking leaf buds for this one, no for increasing leaf size on this one, no for leaves on this one, because even though they're breaking leaf buds, they're not fully leaves yet. But yes, flowers are flower buds, but no for the open flowers. Um, in this slide, yes, we're seeing some breaking leaf buds still. We're also seeing increasing leaf size. If you're seeing increasing leaf size, then you are also seeing leaves. Um, you're also seeing flowers and flower buds, and these ones will have open flowers. Oh, and this one, those little female flowers, I'm just not sure. Embrace the question marks. It's okay to put, you all have permission to put in question marks if you're not sure, all right? Um, so man, I'm not sure if I'm seeing breaking leaf buds or increasing leaf size, um, but I do know I saw um, flowers or flower buds, even though these ones are not open. Um, for recording data on your oak, you have a couple options. You can download and um, print out paper data sheets if you'd like to, if you're the kind of person who prefers to have a paper data sheet on a clipboard and go out there and then record your data on the computer at the end of the week, you're welcome to do that. You can also use the Nature's Notebook mobile app. That's the way I prefer to enter data. Um, and with the app as well, what's really neat about it is it will work whether or not you have service. So if your oaks are like way in a canyon and you don't get service, you're still not stuck with those paper data sheets. You can actually record the data and then download it to the database when you get to some Wi-Fi. Um, and so recording data on your oak as well. Um, monitoring frequency right when you know that like nothing's really going to go on on your oak and this like with open flowers like right now in february it's unlikely that you're going to see open flowers um you might not observe as often so you might not have some nose um and so here too though if what's important though is the more frequently the you monitor it the more accurate the data is so if you only go out once a month like here's a no here's a no and then yes on april 9th you saw flowers this is this whole gap of when we don't know when those flowers appeared. But if you go out like every week or every couple of weeks, you're like, oh, six days, excuse me, six days versus three days. Um, but if you go out, you're seeing no flowers, no flowers, no flowers. Yes, I saw no flowers on April 3rd, but yes, flowers on April 6th. We know that that flowering appeared in this time. So that helps increase the accuracy. It is really nice if you can go out more often when you know you're getting close to flowering time. Um, during the winter, for example, if you like to observe your oaks year round, especially to keep you in the habit, it's okay if you're not going out as often, but when you're kind of aware that um, phenophases are gonna start appearing and things are happening, it's good to go more often. Um, and so once again, um, we'll have specific definitions for each of the phenophases. Um, and you'll also have questions for intensity. And it's okay if you're not comfortable with intensity at first. We also have an observer certification course on our website. Um, if once you have a Nature's Notebook account that will help you to learn a little bit more about the intensity. Um, but you don't, if, we're, if you're looking at intensity, it's like how many flowers on your oak? And you're like, goodness gracious, there's no way I can count all these flowers on my oak. Um, we actually have bins or kind of levels of intensity, right? So if you're saying there's less than three flowers or three to 10 flowers or 11 to 100, 101 to 1,000, 1,001 to 10,000 or more than 10,000. So we have really broad ranges of intensity. So you don't have to worry too much about counting each individual flower. It's more about capturing those peak flowering times when you're getting the most flowers on your oaks. Same with open flowers, they'll have a percentage of open flowers. So what percentage of the flowers are open or not? Is it less than five? Um, a quarter of the flowers are open, up to half of the flowers are open, a little more than half or almost all the flowers are open. Um, so once again, we have these bins where it's a, a range of the percentage. If you're like, I don't know if it's between 49 and 50% of the flowers, like don't stress about that too much, right? Try to get the best that you can but it's really, if you're in those wavy areas, just try to be consistent. 
And then also how much pollen is released. You can do that with like, it's a few granules or there's lots of granules or a layer on your palm, or you're just seeing clouds of pollen coming off of the trees. All right, and so once again, when you're looking at those percentage of fresh flowers, it's really nice because then that tells us with open flowers, like, okay, we're starting to see the flowers open and now we're getting that peak flowering. And when there's a lot of pollen out there, when we're looking at um, what's going on with um, the potential for um, breeding with the oaks. And you get a badge, I love badges. Um, you'll earn your Quirkus Quest badge. Um, when you make observations on one of the oaks in six separate weeks of the year. And you'll be able to see that in your observation deck on our website. It'll show all of your observation badges that you've been earning with Nature's Notebook. All right, so now we're gonna have a chance to test your skills. All right, so once again, here we have a picture of a white oak. And we're gonna, I'm gonna, oh, how do I, I'm gonna do my poll. And we're gonna see how many of you think if you see breaking leaf buds, if it's one or more breaking leaf buds are visible to the plant, basically if the green leaf tip is visible at the end of the bud, um, but before the first leaf has unfolded um, is gonna be breaking leaf buds. Leaves is then when it's fully unfolded. And we say unfolded when you think about a leaf and then that petiole that attaches to the leaf. If you can see that petiole, then the leaf is open, right? And you're no longer breaking leaf buds. You've got increasing leaf size. And increasing leaf size happens is once that leaf is out and it's growing up until it's full growth potential, um, you don't include the elongated ones, but when those leaves are coming out, um, they're increasing until they're full leaves. So I'll put in a poll here where you guys can answer these questions. And you should be able to see the poll, but what do you see on this picture, right? Do you see breaking leaf buds? Do you see leaves? And do you see increasing leaf size? Give everyone here a chance to answer. Oh my gosh, you guys are phenomenal. You're practically pros already, right? So yes, I'm seeing a lot of yeses for the breaking leaf bud. This is definitely a breaking leaf bud. I would say no for leaves on this one because you're not seeing that attachment of the leaf to the petiole. And then if you're not seeing leaves, then you're not seeing increasing leaf size because the leaf, increasing leaf size is that bud has broken and the leaf is out and the leaf is growing. So fantastic job. And if you weren't quite sure, that's fine. It's not like a judgment, right? This is how we're learning and this is how we're growing too. And it's one thing when I show you guys a picture of a little oak leaf like that, but then it's super fun when you're out on the trees and like, and figuring out these nuances. But that's one of the things I love about this program. You'll really get to know your trees and you'll really get to know like those little changes that they're going through every year. So thank you guys. And we'll do one more test of our skills, right? So. Um, with the flowers, here's some beautiful oak flowers, and I actually really like the nice background there too. Um, so with flowers or flower buds, do you see one or more fresh open or unopened flowers, right? So if there's any like flower buds, even if they're not open, you would say yes for flowers or flower buds. Um, for open flowers, um, open flowers is going to be, um, you'll have one or more fresh flowers that are visible on the plant, um, but they're also open when you can see the reproductive parts, which is the male stamens. Um, if you've got the female flowers, if you're able to see them, that's the treat, um, but you'll see those female pistils on the inside. Um, and for this one is like I said, we have for burr oak, Quercus macrocarpa, the male flowers will open once the initial compact cat, oh, catkin, that was the word, has unfolded and is hanging loosely. Female flowers are open when the pistils are visible, but will be very difficult to see when they are out of reach. And then pollen release is one or more of the fl flowers is then releasing visible pollen grains if you gently shake it um, or blow onto a, your palm or on a dark surface. So what you're looking for um, is if these flowers are open and if you see them. So now I will launch our second quiz here. There we go. So what do you see on this picture? Do you see flowers or flower buds? Do you see open flowers with these flowers or flower buds? And do you see pollen release on these guys? I'm seeing the 
and you guys are phenomenal. It's so easy to do this when it's a picture and you're not outside and you have your binoculars and you're trying to look at the top of the oak trees, right? Um, <laughs> but yep, I'm seeing a lot of yes for flowers or flower buds, a lot of no for open flowers and a lot of no for pollen release. Yeah, these are all very tightly closed pollen clusters. Um, if you are ever in that situation, too, when you're out there and you're like, oh, yes, these are open flowers and you come out a week later and you're like, oh, that's what open flowers looks like. You can always go back and, and repair and fix your data and put in like the more accurate data if that's the case. And that's totally fine if you guys do that. All right. And so go ahead if you guys want, if you have um, your phone on you, um, you can actually Put your camera of your phone here and you can sign up for campaign emails for quickest quest messages we'll be putting out messages soon to kick off our campaign as you guys are going to start seeing some flowers um, and leaves on your oak soon unless you have one of those live oaks that's leaping out all the time and you just want to get started which is great too um, but you can sign up for messages where we'll send you those regular um, updates on what your data are showing or if we have other webinars or if there's anything else that um any else any other oak related news and events? Um, and just some special considerations. We do get a lot of emails. We're like, I misidentified my oak species. And that's OK. As you get to know your plants, you may realize it wasn't quite what you thought. So just so you know, um, leaf shape and acorns can help you identify your oak species. Individual trees also may not produce acorns every year. Um, and that's OK if, if your oak didn't produce acorns that year. Um, only female flowers are going to produce the acorns, just so that you're aware. Um, and so they're especially interested in sites that have multiple species of oaks from the list, right? So like, yeah, like I said, you might want to start small, but once you get used to it, if you want to add more oaks um, from more different species in your area, that would be absolutely wonderful because then we have an idea of what's all going on in the same area. And then we're also interested in your site conditions. So you can create your site like on the app. Um, if you go on to our naturesnotebook.org, you can actually um, put in more details about the site, right? Is your oak one that's being watered or not watered? Is it one that's in a really urban or suburban area? Is it being fertilized? Do you know when it was planted? So that's all additional details that can um, help researchers better understand what's going on with these species. And here's what it looks like on the website. We also have an observer certification course, like I kind of gave you the quick version, but this will go into details of the different like protocols and how to do abundance on different species. And here you can manage all your different sites, um, adding, you can add and edit your plants and animals. You can learn more about your different plants and animals. And here you can um, look at your data, enter your data. If you've got a group at a local phenology program, you can look at what's going on with your group's data as well. Um, editing the site right here, this is where you can go and edit like those details if it's watered or fertilized. Um, yep, you can add more details here, how close it is to a road. Um, and all this information just helps us learn a little bit more about what's going on with your oak trees. And here you can add or edit your plants on the web page as well. Um, and you can give it a nickname too. So like it'll default to like Burr Oak One. But if it's like a specific oak, you're like, parking lot burr oak or burr oak by my door, whatever helps you remember which oak is which, because it's really important to follow the same tree through time to kind of um, help control for variation between individuals. And also if it's watered, fertilized, planting date, if you know it. Um, and if you need to, um, if your oak died, you can put it in there as well, but hopefully it does not. We also have lots of different training materials and resources with definitions to the phenophases. If you're like, this is all really weird because I don't really understand plants, but I'm interested in plants. We have this great botany primer um, where you, it's a free PDF and you guys can learn all about like botany and how it pertains to um, phenology with different plant species. Once again, you can take that observer certification course um, and then you can get a little bit more in depth with the protocols and how to observe with nature's notebook. Oh, sorry, I'll keep moving. Um, you can also participate as a part of a group of observers. If you're interested in local phenology programs in your area, you can contact me, Samantha at usanpn.org um, and see about like joining a group uh, or a local phenology program. Um, and so if you don't have your own oak, but you wanna participate, usually they're managing a whole bunch of volunteers who are following these species. And then um, you can help them with those with that data collection. 
Um, if you're interested in starting a local phonology program, we also have an online certification course. Um, it says apply for tomorrow by spring, but um, we've already kind of started this year. But if you're interested, we do have an interest list and I can get you going in the fall. Um, but I can help with uh, volunteer recruitment and retention strategies, joining our community practice. And like, if you're, if you're like, I don't really know how to manage all these volunteers or get a program started, we can get you help with that. Uh, so once again, uh, to participate, just a brief, uh, create your Nature's Notebook account. You can add your site in individual oaks, add details about your site in oaks, sign up for your messages. And there's that QR code again, if you'd like to sign up for those emails, um, take advantage of those training materials and record your observations at least once a week if possible, more often if there's like a lot of exciting things happening, but it's really okay if you can only go once a week. If you need any help getting started or at all through any of your process, or if you want to send me a picture like, I'm really not sure if this is a breaking leaf bud or not, I love getting emails that have pictures in them. It's really fun. So please don't hesitate to email me, uh, Samantha at USANPN.org. All right, I can stop my sharing now. Thank you so much. And I think now we'll be able um, to take time for questions. Thanks so much, Samantha. Uh, we've had a very active Q&A, some of you might have seen, and um, our researcher team has been totally on top of answering all the questions. So I know we only have a couple minutes, but I will make sure that we get all of those great questions and answers from our researcher team um, into the email that we send out following. So uh, for people who are watching this later, you'll be able to see that as well. Um, we did have um, one person who had raised their hand, although I don't see the hand raised anymore. So if you do want to raise your hand, we can let you ask a question live if you like. So feel free to put your hand back up if you want to do that. Um, I see I did... Ian, per Ian Purse oh, yeah. has his hand up. Okay. Oh, did I? I, I did not know that. But uh, oh. uh, it, I, there was something from the, the, the chat mm -hmm. or the question and answer that came a number of times was um, how to keep track of the size of trees or if there were sort of limits or boundaries as to how small of a tree you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I noted that as well. So we don't have a field to indicate the age or the size class of oaks, but we do recommend putting that when you register your plant on your observation deck on the website, there's a, a field where you can put the planting date if you happen to know that, um, if you know perhaps the year that your tree was planted, or there's a comment field and you can put in there what you think the approximate age of your tree is, and that will help as well. Um, so that would be, you know, you can't do that on the app, but if you sign up on the app and get everything started, you can log in with their same account info on the website and then add in all those details that Samantha was talking about for your sites and your plants. Um, and then another thing I just wanted to mention, um, the, there's also a couple questions about um, whether you have a tree, you know, that's in a more urban area. So Samantha also mentioned you can indicate that in the site details as well. So we are interested in both um, urban and non or uh, more natural area oak trees. Um, so you can observe both of those. Just try to indicate that in the the extra questions on that site, um, the edit site page. Um, and then we did have a question about if you do happen to see things like um, uh, oak wilt or galls, um, how to um, indicate that. And you can put that in the comment field that's part of your observation if you like. There's actually a, an open text field each time you make an observation and you can put anything in there that you like. And I'm gonna put the link to sign up for messages again in the chat. Um, we definitely recommend signing up. It's not necessary to be part of the campaign. We'll still count all the data that are collected on these particular oaks as part of the campaign, but it's a nice way to stay in touch and get results back. Um, we'll keep you up to date on what others are reporting as part of the campaign, and we'll share back um, anything that comes out of the research that's part of the, the larger study as well. I'm going to just check on the questions once again. Um, and we can hang on to, I know some people might have to leave, which is totally fine. We'll keep the, the recording going if you want to watch the rest later. But um, I think a couple of us can stick around and keep on uh, answering some of the questions here. Um, will the notebook work without an in the field data collection? I'm not, oh, data connection. Yes, um, the app does work offline. So um, you can also set it to only upload data over Wi-Fi to make sure that, um, you know, even if you get back into cell service, it'll wait to upload until you get back on a Wi-Fi connection so you don't use your data. But yes, it'll store the data locally on the phone if you don't have any service. 
and then you can upload later. We do recommend um, every so often there's a review screen, which is one of the menus on the app. Um, just check on that periodically. There will be a bar at the top. If everything's been uploaded, it'll say user data are up to date with a green bar. And if it's not, it'll have an orange bar that says not up to date. And you can sync data once you're on a Wi-Fi connection, and that will just ensure that everything made it into the database. I got a direct message of, uh, do you know if the live oaks are identified to species? I do believe that our live oaks are, um, are to a specific species. I just don't remember what the species exactly was. Yeah, we've got two um, live oaks that are part of this campaign and then a bunch of other live oaks that are not, they're in a different part of the country, but uh, we have Southern live oak, which is Quercus virginiana. And then we have sand live oak, which is Quercus gemini. Um, we will post this um, as soon as we get off of this webinar, we will be, um, do, the webinar will convert the recording and then we'll get it up online this afternoon and we'll send out the recording later today. And then this question about, um, I do phenology on two white oaks. Can I use these in addition? Um, yeah, you're welcome to observe as many oaks as you like. So yeah, definitely welcome. Uh, we always recommend starting small, you know, just try out if you haven't done it before. Try one oak tree to start, and then if you'd like to add more later, that's wonderful. Uh, is, there's a question, is there a guide to galls? Ian, can you answer that for us? Um, probably the best resource for that is a website called gallformers.org um, that, uh, that is uh, relatively recent and, um, and has a lot of information about different gall species. Um, we'll say that they're still pretty poorly understood. In our surveys, we've probably uncovered a couple of new species just by looking around at different gall wasps uh, on oak trees and, you know, pretty areas where people are at, so not, not very remote places. Great, thank you. All right, I think we got all the questions and I don't see any hands raised. Oh, there's another, find a new tree. So they wait until a specific time of year. Um, well, what we're really interested in as part of this campaign, as Samantha said, is the, um, the start of leaves and then flowering. And we're also really interested in those negative observations that you report before your first yes observation. So um, I would recommend starting now if you like. You can see, you know, if your tree is very dormant, then you can do observations every other week. Um, just kind of keep checking on it. But make sure when you do check it and nothing's happening, report those notes because those are really great for us um, and, and the researchers to be able to see that you actually went out and looked, but you didn't actually see those, those life cycle stages occurring. So yes, please um, start as soon as you can. And then um, you can go less frequently until things really start happening. And then if you see those buds start to swell, then you know things are gonna happen soon. And then maybe go more frequently, maybe once a week or even more frequently if you can and try to capture those transitions where things start happening. You see the first breaking leaf buds and the first flowers. Um, and as far as the best resources to identify species, um, I did post a guide that the USDA puts out for identifying oaks. Um, so that's the best resource we have for Eastern oaks. I don't know of one for Western oaks, but if anyone knows, um, feel free to share it with us. Um, and we can make the chat available as well. I'll um, compile all that together and, and send it out with the email. Okay, any last questions? Just check in the chat one more time. All right, well, thank you all. Thanks to our researcher team. Thanks to Samantha. And thank you to all for being here. Um, feel free to reach out. We're always happy to get your questions. If you start observing and things are confusing, um, you want a little bit of help, um, you can always reach out to us. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys.